I've already had a debate earlier whether it's uh, good morning or just morning this morning, but I'm assured that it's always a good day regardless of the weather outside. Uh, but I just want to welcome you here this morning, um, just as we come and we celebrate our second Sunday of Advent. We hope and we pray that you may know the joy of Christmas as we come to worship the Lord our God and Saviour. Number of announcements, so please do listen up. Um, Cameo lunch this week uh, is a Christmas lunch, so if you've signed up for that, it's slightly earlier than normal, 12 o'clock, um, it will be on. As well as that, tonight in Khalid, uh, they re- want to warmly welcome you to their contemporary Christmas carol service. Um, it's carols with a difference, that's at half past seven tonight in Khalid. It'll be lovely to have a great turnout from Lone Ends here as well. Next Sunday, um, it'll, it'll be great to show your support the Sunday School Salt and Light will be leading our nativity service. That's always a delight. I've already heard the children sing and they are heavenly in their uh, singing. And it'll be great encouragement not only to them but to, the, to the, everybody associated with the Sunday School to be there. As well as that, in the evening we're having our traditional nine lessons and carols. And that will be followed by a cup of tea in the hall. It would be lovely to see everybody. Invite your families and friends. Christmas is a real opportunity for us to open up our doors um, so that people can come in, that we can get to know them and build future relationships. As well as that, we have our church committee will be on on Tuesday at half past seven. So please, if if you're part of the committee, if you could um, please be at that. But these are our announcements. But we come now to worship God in the midst of the hustle and the bustle. We come in peace. We come to reflect in what God has done. And to be still and know that God is here. Acknowledgement of this time of year, what we do is we remember that we were not we were once not a people, but through faith in Christ. That we've been brought to be the people of God. We take some time. We're going to acknowledge that. We haven't done it for a wee while. But take some time. Get out of your seat. And welcome one another. In the name of the Lord. And we'll come back to our seats once more. I always think it's lovely to be reminded that Christmas time is a time of peace. Peace between all people. And we're very much proclaiming that today. I'm just going to, as we prepare to receive the Lord as God's people this morning, I'm going to just, we're going to receive the words from Isaiah chapter 9 verse 2 as our call to worship. Famous Christmas words. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. In light of that, we come now as God's people. And we're going to come and we're going to praise his holy name. We do so now as we sing our opening piece. O come all ye faithful.
be seated. We're now going to turn to the Lord as we come to him in our prayers of adoration, confession and assurance. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we rejoice today that you came in fulfillment of an age-old prophecy, vindicating at last the long-held expectation of your people. After so many years of frustrated hope, so many false dawns and disappointments, you dwell among us, the Prince of Peace, the promised Messiah, Son of God, Son of Man, Son of David. You have shown us what God has promised shall be accomplished. We praise you for that assurance. And we rejoice that we are the heirs to those promises of old. For you came not only to your own people, but to the whole human race. Born to set us free from everything that enslaves us and to open the way to eternal life to anyone who follows you. You have shown us what God has promised shall be accomplished. And so we praise you. We rejoice that your purposes for the world continues. And that the time will come when your kingdom shall be established and your victory be complete. We thank you that as you once came, you will come again. As you will depart into heaven. Bringing justice. And reconciling all creation through your love. So we look forward in confidence to that day. When there will be no more sorrow or suffering or hatred. Or evil, darkness or death. That day when you will be all in all. You have shown us God your promises shall be accomplished. We praise you for that assurance. Lord though you have shown that tender loving care towards us. We know that each of us have not responded always as we should. Lord, at times we have selfishly shown self-love rather than devoting our hearts to you. And so in a moment of silence, we confess the ways in which we have failed you this week. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, we ask that you would not treat us according to our sins and how they deserve, but you would instead mercifully treat us according to the grace found in Christ alone. People of God who trust in his precious blood, may we receive the pardon found in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Lord, grant us to eternal life now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, do we have any birthdays? No, no birthdays today. Well, boys and girls, if you want to come up to the front, it'll be good to see you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, well, that was quite a good good morning. You know, sometimes it's like, good morning, but today it's not so bad. So how's everybody feeling this morning? Good. Oh, you're yes, feeling good. Are you, are you getting a bit excited about Christmas? I have a double sleepover from my grandma's birthday. A double sleepover? As long as you get lots of sleep, will you? Okay. And and have you slept really well there? Uh, I had a bad cough. Oh dear. So if Brian falls asleep during the service, we know why. <laughs> well, do you know what? Is anybody getting excited about Christmas? Yes, okay. Well, do you know what? What things do you look forward to at Christmas time? What things when you when you're next few weeks, what kind of things are you looking forward to? Look, what are you looking forward to? Presents, of course. 
We love do you love getting the presents and yes, Emily. Getting turkey. Turkey. Do you like turkey? Do you, do you get some gravy in your turkey? Oh yes, gravy and some stuffing. Yes. Anything else you're looking forward to? Yes, El. Seeing family, oh, isn't it? It's great to have them all around. There's always a bit of crack, isn't there? Anything else? Is anybody looking forward to getting off school? <laughs> I can't believe you didn't even mention that one. You love being off GB as well. I hope Liz, I hope Liz isn't going to be watching this here later. So here's some of the things that we look forward to. We look forward to getting off school for two weeks. I don't know about you, but some people I know get excited about Christmas Eve. They even have matching pajamas. And it's not something we've done in our house, but I know some people do. Excited. Oh, by good food. Isn't it good to have really good food at Christmas? And ice cream, yeah. And it's exciting to get presents. But Christmas, we're looking forward to something else. We're looking forward to celebrating Jesus' birthday. So when we're, we're excited about something that happened a long, long time ago, that Jesus came and we, maybe we're doing our nativity at school, maybe we're reading at home, and we're excited about things that happened over 2,000 years ago. But you know, Christmas is also a time about excited about something that is to come. Because, you know, who came in the first Christmas? Jesus. Jesus. Wonder who's going. And how did he come? Did he come as a big strong man? Yes, Ella. Came from Mary as a little baby. But you know, the Bible tells us about a new. There's going to be a second Christmas. And you know, does anybody maybe know who's going to come in the second Christmas? Yeah. Well, you'll maybe hear that now, okay? Jesus is going to come back again. And he's not going to come as a tiny baby. He's going to come as a mighty king. And he's going to set up a new kingdom. And we've read about it sometimes in the Bible. And it says there's no more crying and no more pain. It's going to be joy. Because he's going to be the king of the whole world for his people. And so at this Christmas time, yes, we look back and we are excited about, what, about Jesus coming. But we also look forward to a day where Jesus will come again. And I don't know about you, but sometimes, boys and girls, this world is not, it's broken. We see it all the time. Floods and people sad and people dying and hurt. But when Jesus comes again, he's going to fix everything. And actually, there's a Bible verse that says, The creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. In other words, even the all of creation is waiting for the second Christmas. So this Christmas, I want us all to be prepared the next Christmas when Jesus will come to fix the world. Let's pray. Dear Lord our God, we come and we pray and we thank you. God, we thank you for the excitement that we feel, the joy of spending time with family, the joy of being able to receive and to give presents, the joy of being able to enjoy wonderful food. But more than that, we thank you for the joy of knowing that Jesus, through Jesus, that we can know you now but God, when you come again, we'll know you even better. God, help the boys and girls to be really eager and prepared for that day. We pray this in your name. Amen. Boys and girls, we're now going to sing your song, which is called Hear the Bells.
Lawrence can I go to Chelsea Church? <laughs> going to come to pray for others. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, as we come in prayer, we lift our eyes of ourselves and we lift our eyes heavenwards. We acknowledge that these words that we will bring before you are effective because of the one who intercedes in our behalf. May the thought of the Lord Jesus Christ interceding on our behalf from heaven embolden us to come into your presence with persevering and expectant prayer. O Sovereign Lord, at this time of year, we think about the many who dread this time of year. We know in this economic climate that many people are struggling already to meet ends meet. And at Christmas time, it often adds extra pressure to what are already stretched budgets. With the drop of temperature, the expectation of Christmas gifts, and the desire to make Christmas memorable. For so many people this Christmas, it will be a time of great struggle. Lord, we pray that you may help people to steward their money well. So that they may be able just to help other people as well. God, we pray for us as a body here that we may be moved to sacrificially give to those who are struggling. Not just with our resources, but with our time and our care. Lord, we come and we want to pray for the work uh, of the World Development Appeal. Lord, last week we were remembering about it, Lord, and we continue to remember. We pray, Lord, as a congregation that we may sacrificially give Lord, we confess that at times that we can be wasteful of some of our money. Yet in many of these places, they have little to nothing. God, we want to pray that, Lord, you would take the money raised from the Presbyterian Church in Ireland and that you would use it and multiply it for your kingdom. Finally, Lord, at this Christmas time, we acknowledge that many, even in our congregation and in our community, may be lonely this Christmas. Whether it's because of the pain of bereavement, our illness, our family estrangement, our mental health issues. We know this time of year can actually exasperate loneliness and even lead to resentment of others. Lord, we want to pray that our Christmases may not only be a time that we notice our own friends and family, but may we extend our hospitality beyond our own walls. We pray for a cultivation of a real community which seeks to lift others out of their loneliness. Lord, you have made us for relationships and in relationship we, may we prosper. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God is good all the time. All the time God is good. And we proclaim that this morning as we in response to our worship this morning we give our tithes and offerings to the Lord. And as we do so, we're going to sing our next item of praise, Bethlehem.
may be seated. This morning we're going to be continuing on in our Advent series as we count down to Christmas, particularly through Old Testament passages. And so what we're going to look, if you go with me in the Pew Bibles, it's uh, page 15, and we're going to look at um, chapter 15. This is the word of the Lord, chapter 15 of Genesis. This is the word of the Lord. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your great reward. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no, no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look at the heavens and count the stars, as if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he, it was, and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you the land to take possession of it. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, who can I know that I shall be in possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all of these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the half opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into deep sleep. And thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. And they will be enslaved and ill-treated for 400 years. But I will punish the nation after they serve as slaves. And after the words they will come with great possessions. You however will bring to your fathers in peace. And will be buried at good old age. In the fourth generation your descendants will come back here. The sins of the Amorites have not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and the darkness had fallen. A smoking bazaar with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I will give the land from the river of Egypt. To the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Canaanites, the Kenyazites, the Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hephaphites, Amorites, Canaanites, Gergesites, and the Jezbusites. May the Lord bless our reading to us. I'm sure that you've got to know me well enough over the last year and a half nearly to know that I love nothing more than a bargain. I think as a Balamina man, there's certainly something bred in us. And a few years ago, I thought I'd hit the ultimate jackpot. I was looking online and I seen this smartwatch came up for sale at an absolute bargain price. Think of this was like the Swiss army knife of smartwatches. It did everything you could imagine and more. In many ways it didn't matter that I wouldn't use half the functions. At the price it was at I just had to have it. And so of course I ordered it. Each day multiple times a day I would log on to the website to see how my order had progressed. However, one day turned into a week, a week turned into two weeks. I quickly discovered that I wasn't the only one having these problems. And to make things worse, some people had even got an email to say their order was cancelled. Yet I continued to wait and hope to think I would be the exception. However, the dreaded email came. My order was cancelled. The offer seemed too good to be true. And it obviously was. I reckon a lot of people feel the same about Christmas. They love to hear the story of baby Jesus. They love to hear about the goodwill and everything else. 
And when they think of the Christmas hope, they wonder, surely it's too good to be true. They're worried about getting their hopes up for something that they believe will never be able to deliver what it promises. With that, many just simply dismiss it out of hand and subsequently miss out on what Jesus wants to offer them. This this morning, we're going to think of that question. Is Christmas too good to be true? For we don't need to just blindly accept the claims of the scriptures. But the basis we have is sure and won't let us down. How much does it cost to come to know God? How much do we pay to be in relationship with God? Or in retail terms, what's it's RRP, the retail trading price. So often we consider such a question without really giving it the thought that it needs. So often in the West, we kind of have this vague idea that somehow God is gracious and God, does, it's within his right, he should forgive us and welcome us into a relationship with no strings attached. However, I hope we saw from last week that such is the rebellion in our hearts that it can never be that simple to come into a relationship with God. Christmas shows us the cost of redemption. A cost must be met if we are wanting to come before God. And that's what we deal with here in chapter 15 of Genesis. In which we've seen God graciously initiate a covenant with Abram. In the passage, the living God appears to Abram and says, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your great reward. By this stage, God has already appeared a number of occasions to Abram. He had promised that his offspring would turn into a great nation and that they would possess the promised land forever. However, there was one major problem. He didn't have any children. And he was very old. Up to this point, Abraham didn't question God. Maybe he hoped above hopes that maybe this promise could actually be true. Yet as time went on, Abram's hope began to dissipate. Maybe it is too good to be true, he thought to himself. We very much pick that up in verses 2 and 3 where he says, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain, remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus? You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. It's as if Abraham here is settling for less than God has promised him. It's as if he's happy enough for anything God gives him. I feel like me downgrade my hopes of that great smartwatch for a cheap imitation instead. Yet God reassures him. He says, this man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. That God takes him outside and says, look at the sky and count The stars, if indeed you can count them, so will be your offspring. And we're told that Abraham believed the Lord at his word and it was counted to him as righteousness. In order for us to understand the significance of this, we have to realize that what's going on here is more than just an impact on one single family. You see, Abraham's family had been chosen to be a vehicle To which God would seek to restore humanity back to himself. Remember how the relationships have been absolutely shattered vertically and horizontally by the fall. As we have seen in our lives, in our society. That's why this family is so important here. This was a family from the the lineage of Eve. This special line we talked about last week. And it would be through this family that God's salvation plan would be initiated to save people back to himself. A people who would be redeemed from the bondage of sin. A people who would be restored. However, there would be a great cost to making this dream a reality. We see this in uh, God's response to Abraham's question in verse 8 in which Abraham had asked, How can I know that I'll take possession of it? 
In other words, Abraham's saying, how do I know, God, that your promises aren't too good to be true? With God, with that, God seeks to answer his question by initiating that covenant between Abraham and his descendants and Yahweh. We've talked about covenant before, but just a refresher in case we forgot. A covenant is a relationship between God and his people, where God promises blessings if conditions are kept and threatens curses if they're broken. Yahweh would be their gods, and Abraham and his descendants would be his people. Abraham and his future offspring had promised to walk faithfully with God. And God in return would promise to protect and bless them all their days. Yet if they rejected, rebelled, or disobeyed against God, then wrath and curses would be upon them. This would be demonstrated in the initiation of the covenant itself. We hear that Abraham was told to take a, a heifer, a goat, a ram, as, long as, as well as a dove and young pigeon. He was told to sacrifice them and cut their carcasses in two and arrange them opposite side each other, sides of each other. This would have been a common practice within the Near East for making covenants. See, the idea was that as they were to agree the covenant, the stronger party would make the younger or the weaker party walk through these sacrifices. The meaning was all too visually clear. See, by initiating that covenant and walking through those animal carcasses, the weaker party was agreeing that if they broke the terms of the conditions of the covenant, that they, like the sacrifice, would be struck down. You see, there would be a great price for humanity coming back to God. They would have to keep the covenant completely. And the problem is, since sin has come into the world, we know that no one can keep the law of God perfectly. That is, in our sinful state, no one can fulfill God's righteous law. And that's not just Old Testament thinking. Sometimes when people come to the Old Testament, they say, oh, well, that's the Old Testament God. But that's simply not the case. We see the same in the New Testament. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 20, whoever keeps the whole law is or no, he said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, you certainly will not enter the kingdom of God. James 2 says, whoever keeps the whole law is stumbled just on one point is guilty of breaking the whole thing. It's like breaking a, a bit of that window. One bit means the whole window's broke. I mean, even if we went our whole lives with not sinning and at the very end we made one mistake. The whole law will be broke. Here's the problem. The cost to acquire a relationship with God is far too high. It's beyond our, the, our capabilities. No one born of Adam ever has or ever will be able to keep those commands. In, all, in that, all of us are doomed. This hope of salvation is out there, but it's out of our reach. Although we may want these blessings associated with covenant keeping, we're destined to curses of covenant breakers. However, before the end of the ceremony, we will be given hope to an alternative route to redemption. Think back to my smartwatch. Why was it that the retailer was unwilling to honour my order? Well, the simple reason was that in order to fulfil my order, they would have had to have been willing to absorb some of the cost themselves. There was two, no two ways about it. The price had to be paid one way or another. They couldn't give me the smartwatch without doing so. And it was obvious through their cancellation that they were either unwilling or unable to do so. Yet in Christmas, it shows us that God was willing to absorb the cost. You can imagine Abram's apprehension as he looked at those carcasses that had been split in two, as he thought of the possibility of having to walk through them, as he knew deep down that he would never be able to keep the law of God. It was then we're told that he fell into a deep sleep. And in that state, God once more reassured him that his promises would be true. But this time he detailed how and when they would take possession of the Holy Land. Following this, 
in the surrounding darkness of the night was lit up by what is described as a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch. And before Abraham's very eyes, that that fire went through the pieces of sacrifice. Seems a very odd sight, doesn't it? Split animals on fire. But who is normally associated with fire in scripture? Who would later come in the pillar of fire to guide the people in the wilderness? Of course, this was a, a pre- the presence of the Lord here. Do you see what's happening? Even before Abram was able to sign up to this covenant, before he was able to initiate the covenant, God himself walked through the sacrifices. Here we have the promise maker becoming the promise keeper. God, remarkably, was guaranteeing the covenant himself. See, by passing through these carcasses, he was declaring that even if Abram or his descendants were to break this this covenant, this punishment would not come upon them, but would come upon him. That he would take the punishment the covenant breakers deserved. He would be willing to absorb the great cost. That he would pay the full debt. It's truly remarkable. Such a concept was unheard of in the ancient world and even indeed today. The promised hope of relationship with God is not a vain hope. It's not a misprice. It's not a promise without the ability to redeem it. It's real. Instead, we see that although it would be free for Abram to be part of God's people, for God it would mean a great price. God himself would have to absorb the cost of Abram and his descendants to come into a covenantal relationship with him. In order to do so, he would have to pay for each and every sin that they committed. Each would need to be fully paid. God would take that wrath that they deserve and pour it upon himself. Then and only then would Abram's family be freed to enjoy blessing rather than curse. Well, Abraham couldn't fully have understood. We here, this post side of Christmas, can understand so much better. It's the reason why Christmas should lead us to great joy. For Christmas, we have God incarnate, God dwelling among us with the mission to pay off the debt of our sins so that we can receive this wonderful gift. More than a smartwatch, He has purchased the gift of salvation for us. So our sins may be forgiven. So that we may be declared righteous children of God. So that we may know God not just as a master but as a father. And so that we may receive the gift of the Holy Spirit which will seal us to the day end of redemption. You see, Jesus as he came kept the law of God perfectly from start to finish. And as he did so, and he willingly went to sacrifice himself on the cross, he endured that wrath that was rightly ours. He absorbed the cost to bring us into God's favor. He who knew no sin became sin for us. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. Although sometimes salvation sounds too good to be true. Through Christ it's not. In fact through Christ it's even better than we could possibly even imagine. Although that begs the question. Who belongs to Abraham's family and will receive such a pardon and such a gift? In Galatians chapter 3, Paul tells us that through saving faith in Christ as Savior, we too become children of Abraham, and like him we will be blessed. While those who rely on themselves, who think I'm good enough without Jesus, who rely on the works of the law, they will remain under the curse of sin. Yet to those who look to the promise keeper, they will be redeemed for blessing. He redeemed us in order that we, that blessing given to Abraham could be ours. You know, this Christmas, that's the challenge we have. Are we one of Abraham's children? If 
Folks, the only way to be children of God is through faith in this promise keeper. None of us are good enough without him. There's no other way. We cannot access God by our own moral obedience. Because as we've seen, we all have stumbled. We are all covenant breakers. Instead, we need someone who's willing to stand up and absorb the cost for us. Folks, I'm sure there's people here this morning. You've never taken the plunge. Maybe deep down you think you're too good to be able to need Jesus. But you can't just let go of that feeling of, can I urge you in the strongest possible terms, don't experience Christmas this year without receiving the greatest gift that has ever been given. By faith, receive it. For it is eternal life for all those who look upon Jesus. And for the many of you here this morning who are Christians, who are believers, who know this, can I urge you, don't get bored of this. It's so easy for us to hear this story over and over again to switch off. But may we delight in what God has done for you. That God loved you so much that he was willing to send himself to suffer on our behalf. That he was willing to pay that great cost that we never could to redeem us for something more glorious than we ever could imagine. While my delight in a temporary watch wouldn't last long. Yet we're assured of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ as our saviour. If this doesn't excite you as a Christian, there's something wrong in your walk. This is good news of liberation from sin, of transformations not only of your life here, but for eternity more. And as we delight in this story, may it lead us to want other people to be part of this story as well. So that our lives proclaim the story of the goodness of Christ in our lives. If I find a bargain, I love to tell others about it. May we, as we receive Christ today, may we be looking to shine so that other people can receive him and their lives can be changed forever. May we look to the promise maker who has become the promise keeper for us. Let's pray. Dear Lord our God, we come and we pray. Who of us could stand in your presence? Who of us could demand that we would have a relationship with you? Who of us could know you as a friend and as a father, if not by the Lord Jesus Christ? God, I know to some that you maybe, they've maybe heard this message over and over again or maybe even hardened to it. Yet God, may your spirit bring conviction. May your spirit draw people to yourself. Lift the bondage of sin and bring them into the light of your blessing. And for us who are Christians, who are believers, Lord, I pray that this message may not grow old. That every time that we hear it, we may delight deep in our hearts. That may fuel us to live lives worthy of the great calling. And Lord, as we reflect on that in our lives, that our lives may be worthy of the great calling that you've given us. God, bless us and keep us. Shine your face upon us so that this Christmas that we may bring light into darkness, that we may bring hope into despair, that we may bring joy into sadness. We pray this in your name. Amen. We're going to respond as we sing our final item of praise. Tell out my soul. May this be a response of what we do with that wonderful message of the gospel we have.
And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now, now and forevermore. Amen. And may God make us a blessing wherever he puts us.